Hello friends and welcome to my Beat the Bloat workshop. So I've got so many good things that I want to share with you in here. So let's get started. Okay, so I'm going to put me up there. So, let's go. This is a workshop that I'm very excited about and I just want to say thank you so much for being here today, watching the recording, investing your time, because I know time is very precious, so I appreciate you taking the time to watch this workshop. What we will be going through, so this is just a little structure so you know what's coming up. I'll spend about 10 minutes going through some background information so we're all on the same page and you understand what I'm talking about. And for about half an hour of the workshop content, I'm going to spend around five minutes talking about Seabo Freedom, my group coaching program. Amazing. And then I've got a bunch of questions that were submitted when I ran this workshop live. So I'm going to go through those as well. So really good questions. All right. If you have any other questions, just pop them down underneath this video and I will get to them as best I can as well. I like to start with my story. So it depends on how long you've been following me or how you found me. You may know some of it, you may not. I kind of joke that I popped out the womb on the digestive back foot. So apparently I was a very colicky baby, always screaming whenever I was fed. I like to ask my clients, like, when was the first time you came aware of your symptoms? And I also like to ask, when was the very first time that you can remember something being off with your digestive system? For me, that's around eight years old. So I can remember always complaining of tummy aches. Even from that early age, I was aware that I was a bit funny with food because I had learned that when I eat food, it hurt. So I would try to avoid eating, but then I'd be so hungry, so then I'd eat too much, and then my tummy would hurt as well. So for me, I started developing this negative relationship with food from like eight years old. That's so young. Um, so I was always trying all the different things from a desire just to feel better than I did. So any sort of diet or latest fad or something, I try, if you eat cabbage all day long, you'll feel good, I'll try that. If you do the Atkins diet, you'll feel good, I tried that. I tried all the things and I would feel better like for a little bit of time, but then usually I just felt worse than before I'd even started. Uh, I also always struggled with my weight. For me, that meant it was very easy for me to gain weight, very hard for me to lose weight. I get that's not everybody's story, so about half my clients actually struggle to gain weight, which in some ways is even worse because society will tell you, oh, you look great, and on the inside, it's like, oh. Um, and then I kind of fell into being a naturopath. So I heard someone give this introductory talk on what naturopathy was all about. I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. That's what I want to do. So I signed up to the course there and then, and I've learned so much about myself, so much about the body, and also how there's no one-size-fits-all approach to everybody. So in college, we learned that the vegetarian diet was the healthiest diet out there, so I went vegetarian. I was like, great, this is it. I'm going to feel amazing. I felt awful <laughs> because my digestive system was in such a mess trying to eat all those, that fiber, so I was eating all the hummus, all the chickpeas, all the lentil curries, I just felt so bad. I gained a bunch of weight, about 25 pounds, about 10 kilos. I had constant brain fog. My skin was horrendous. I had so much acne. It was sore. It was painful. It was so embarrassing. Um, my hormones were out of balance. I was tired all the time. I just felt sore all the time because my body was so inflamed. So even though the food that I was eating was actually healthy, it was harmful to me at the time because my digestive system couldn't handle it. So over time, um, I tried like the low carb diet, I tried the keto diet. Um, at the height of my issues, I was stuck just eating chicken and eggs because those were the only things that didn't make me bloat. So in the short term, that gave me some relief. I felt, I felt better, but long term, I had a rebound effect, which made things worse. So if I could eat like a little bit before, after doing that, I could hardly eat anything. So it, just, it took me some time to come back from there. But I absolutely have. So I feel amazing now. And I eat a mostly plant-based diet now. This works amazing for me. So I have been normal size. I've been a lot bigger than that. I've lost the weight. Where I'm currently sitting now, like I feel really good in my skin. So I don't need to do too much to maintain it. I do put effort into my health because it make, I know I get the rewards now. So back then I felt so frustrated because I was doing all the right things, but I wasn't getting the results that I was after. So now, this is just the last time I took photos, I'm pretty much the same now. 
Um, so now I don't count calories back here. I did this on purpose. I was restricted dieting. I would freak out if I ate like five calories extra than my allotted amount for the day. And then this is just in between, like I had SIBO in between here. And then when I started eating the foods again, because I developed such a disordered relationship with food, when I could eat the foods, I ate all the foods. So I gained so much weight. There's about 30 kilos difference there, about 70 pounds. So then I had to do work on like the physical stuff. So I had to get my microbiome back in balance. I had to heal my gut lining. I had to make sure I was actually eating enough nutrition because I was starving on the inside because I just couldn't break down the food that I was eating. And then I also had to do some emotional work, um, healing my self-hate. I had a lot of self-hate, which was really confronting to hear. Um, but now I don't. So like back here, it was very hard for me to look myself in the mirror, in the eyes, let alone looking at people in the eyes, you know. And here, like, I'm, I'm really happy. And it's my physical health and my mental and emotional health. So back here, I... To describe the feeling, it was like literally terrified. Like I would be sobbing on the bathroom floor, intellectually knowing that I was okay, but it didn't feel okay on the inside. I was really scared. Now, yeah, I'm very happy. Um, and what you see is me in real life. Like I am most of the time pretty happy and bubbly, optimistic. Um, I still have days I get grumpy. Like you know, that's that's part of it um, but most of the time I'm feeling pretty damn good and I can eat all the foods and wear my bikini again and feel happy so if I can do it you can do it too I'm no one special uh, just takes time so what you're going to learn in here today is some of the basics to get started with right so this is just a little glossary so when you're watching it you might want to take a picture of this screen so you can come back to it so bloating, so bloating is abdominal distension, so pretty much your belly is puffing out most of the time. So most of the time you can see it, some of the times it's more of a feeling. Uh, distension, so swelling and becoming large from pressure inside, most of the time due to gas. Inflammation, I talk about quite a lot. So inflammation is very helpful short term. So say I've cut my finger, my, my new knife is very sharp. So it's a little bit red at the moment, which is helpful. So it's raising the temperature so it can kill the bacteria. But if I don't look after that and it gets all festy and becomes chronically inflamed, then the infection can spread and the immune system can go a little bit haywire. Inflammation is the root of all chronic diseases. Cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, they all have inflammation in connection. How chronic inflammation might feel in your body you probably have brain fog, like, oh, why did I come into this room? What's going on? Um, you probably feel very stiff in your body. Um, fibromyalgia sometimes gets given as a diagnosis when it could be like all of a chronic inflammation. So like if you, some, if someone used to touch my arm to, with too much pressure, I'd be like, oh, it's so sore. Um, and reacting to foods that shouldn't really be causing a reaction. So SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is not necessarily bad bacteria, it's just in the wrong spot. Our small intestine should be relatively sterile. Uh, EMO is a new term that's been used now, uh, intestinal methanogen overgrowth, because the methanogens aren't actually bacteria, they are archaea, so they release the methane gas. Um, but that term doesn't really distinguish between your small and your large intestine. So yeah. LIBO, large intestinal bacterial overgrowth, aka dysbiosis, so an imbalance of bacteria in your large intestinal microbiome, where we do want the bacteria, but we want them in certain ratios and proportions. Visceral hypersensitivity, so this is super, super common. So visceral, uh, your viscera is your internal organs. Hypersensitivity, so it's oversensitive or overreactive. So this is very common in people that have had digestive issues for a while, people that have had SIBO for a while, food intolerances for a while. If something is getting triggered over and over and over, it's going to become more sensitive. So it's going to become overreactive. So visceral hypersensitivity can result from having digestive issues for a while, from having food intolerances for a while. And then, because we have so many nerve endings in our digestive system, there's around 500 million nerve endings in our digestive system versus 300 million-ish in our central nervous system, our spinal cord. 
So there's that many nerve endings in there. If they are oversensitive, they're going to be reacting to everything. So often I can kind of see visceral hypersensitivity in most of my clients, to be honest. But say you're getting bloated with water, potentially visceral hypersensitivity, things like that, amongst other things. Uh, leaky gut, or the scientific term, is intestinal permeability. Permeability is what we use to describe um, the membrane when we can, when certain things can pass through it. So we want the permeability to be strong enough um, or small enough that only like our vitamins and minerals or amino acids pass through into our bloodstream. If the tight junctions of your gut become separated, this is leaky gut or intestinal permeability, so now it's too permeable. So bigger things can get through into the bloodstream that aren't meant to, like say whole proteins instead of individual amino acids. And the body wants to protect the balance of your blood at all costs because once it gets into the bloodstream it goes body wide so if toxins are getting into your bloodstream and then going body wide that's a big problem so if things are getting through into the bloodstream that aren't meant to your immune system is attacking it so your immune system can get confused this is where we develop autoimmune conditions um histamine intolerance you know the immune system is now confused and is it attacking things that would normally in our digestive system be considered harmless now become harmful to us Motility refers to the movement of most of your food through your digestive tract, and then your migrating motor complex, sometimes just written as MMC, is a sweeping wave that goes through your intestines every 90 minutes. So it's pushing through your food, but also bacteria, yeasts, parasites. Because we swallow so much stuff. Ideally, our stomach acid is strong enough to kill things on the way down. What doesn't get killed hopefully gets pushed through and out the other end. So handy to know. Floating is so annoying. So what I'm going through today is going to be a lot of the low-hanging fruit, a lot of the simple wins, not always the easy wins. So it takes time and dedication to implement some of these things, but they make such a difference. And people often overlook these things, I feel, because sometimes they can seem too simple. And something I see quite a lot as well is people go chasing chasing more diagnoses so that they can pinpoint all their problems on one thing. Therefore, if they fix that one thing, it's going to solve all their problems. That's almost never the case. So there's lots of little things that you need to do that will add up to the big results. So simple changes, come here first. I refer to it as the lower hanging fruit. So do a lot of these things, see how much gets resolved, and then see if you need to do anything else. Most of the time you do, if you're here, like you're probably pretty sick. People that find me have often been to four, five, six, ten. The other day I had someone that had been to 40 doctors before finding me. So uh, often people say, well, I've been to so many practitioners, what are you going to do different? Like uh, my programs are so comprehensive. It's never just about the SIBO or just about the bloating or just about anything. When you can rebuild your whole digestive system and get it working as it should and also paying attention to what's going on with your nervous system or your hormones or or, 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 it's like when you find out what's the reason why things have been going wrong and solve it from there, then it stays fixed. Um, and then just remember the 80-20 rule. So this applies to many things in life. So say if you're doing an assignment for college, you probably get 80% of the marks on 20% of the work. Chasing that last 20% will take 80% of the effort. So with these ones as well, you can get 80% um, relief from doing 20% of the effort and then to get that last 20% of the healing, it's more of the gradual, longer stuff. Cool. Okay, so how does bloating feel? To do this slide, I pretty much just took myself back in time to how does it make me feel. And this is one of the reasons why it makes me so good at what I do, because I've been, I've been you, you know, and make, it makes it so much easier for me to relate to you because I was you. All right, so it's uncomfortable, heavy often, hard to breathe. This can be because when your belly or your abdomen is filled with gas, it creates that pressure and it's gonna push your diaphragm up. Your diaphragm is the muscle that's connected with breathing. And so what should happen when you take a breath in, the diaphragm should pull down, which then allows the lungs to expand. But if there's so much buildup in your abdomen, the diaphragm can't come down, so then your lungs can't expand, so you often feel short of breath. So, you know, that sort of feeling. A tight pulling sensation. For me, it just felt like someone was trying to pull the skin. Full, 
sometimes painful, not actually that often. It's only like a small percentage of my clients that will comment on feeling pain alongside the bloating. A lot of times it's just uncomfortable. Embarrassing. I got so embarrassed. So when I was dealing with my SIBO, I was a yoga teacher. I felt so embarrassed going to the front of class to teach yoga. But I couldn't even touch my toes because my bloated belly was in the way. It was so uncomfortable. And I also found it so frustrating because I would try to do all the right things. Like I knew what foods were healthy, but every time I tried to eat them, my body would hate me for it. So I felt so separate from my body. It was, and I'd often find myself just saying, like, just tell me what you want to do and I'll do it. Which showed me how separate I felt from my body. Whereas now I'm in tune with my body and I'm like, what do we want to do? What do I want to do? You know, it's like not this separate feeling anymore. So yeah, you can get there. And it's frustrating because it's often the healthy foods that create the most amount of bloating due to the fiber content. So me, when I was going vegetarian in college, so I did it for like six months and I was really good. Like all the beans and pulses and all the things were just so much fiber. But because my digestive system was so out of balance, I couldn't break it down which led to so much fermentation and toxicity. So I was, I was toxic on the inside from the healthy food. So so frustrating. So this is me just before I found out that I had SIBO. So for those of you that maybe are carrying some extra weight, you could look at this and say you look fine. But those of you maybe are underweight might be able to feel it. So here I was pretty small, I was pretty thin. I was restrictive dieting, did that on purpose. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. I think that probably added to my issues. So this is the night before, and then that's the morning after. Like this facial expression, it just felt like I could finally breathe. So like that shortness of breath that I was talking about. So this bloat, it's just so hard and full of air that's like pushing up on my diaphragm so I couldn't get a full breath. So here it just felt like, oh. I don't know if you can relate to that. So what causes the bloat? And these are some of the simple things first. So just check in with yourself on how you go with these. So eating too fast. If you eat too fast, one, you aren't breaking down the food. So we have our teeth there for a reason. By breaking our food down into smaller and smaller and smaller parts, it makes it easier on the rest of our digestive system. And we can consciously control how often we chew. Once we swallow and it goes down our throat and down our esophagus, it's up to our autonomic nervous system. So we can't consciously think about, unless you're like a mad schools yogi person but most of us can't actually control how much stomach acid we release or not that's up to our body or enzymes or the motility but we can think about how often we chew each mouthful so see how that goes for you eating too much so if you put too much toilet paper in the toilet it's going to clog the pipes if you put too much food in your digestive system it's going to clog the pipes your digestive system is like one long pipe from beginning to end uh, eating too often, this is to do with our migrating motor complex that I mentioned in that glossary. So the migrating motor complex will come through every 90 minutes and push through food, bacteria, yeast, whatever's built up. Depending on the size of the meal, so like an average size meal, the migrating motor complex will stop for three hours. And we want that to happen because then the enzymes can get in there and break it apart. The contractions of your digestive muscles can break the food down more and more and more. So we want that to happen. But then we want the migrating motor complex to kick back in again. So if you're eating a meal and then two hours later having a snack and then two hours after that having another meal, the migrating motor complex won't get a chance to push things through. So it's like food on top of food on top of food. So you can feel probably really bloated by the end of the day. And just have air. Swallowing air sounds ridiculous, but if you're a gum chewer, you're going to be swallowing air often. Uh, food intolerances can cause the bloating. So an intolerance is different to an allergy. So if you have a food allergy, it's often things like, say, shellfish, peanuts, eggs, you'll often get quite an immediate reaction and it tends to be outside the digestive system. So you could have an anaphylactic throat closing situation. You could get hives. You can also get hives from intolerances, though. But the immediacy and the, the dose... So just like a crumb of gluten for someone with celiac disease, when they're allergic to gluten, a crumb can cause an allergic reaction. Whereas a gluten intolerance, maybe you can have half a piece of bread and be fine. But if you have two slices of bread, that's not fine. So it's your tolerance level. So food intolerances can cause the bloat because they can cause irritation, they can cause inflammation and bloating. 
Fermentation, so bacteria, their process of digestion is through fermentation. The fermentation can create gas. Like if you've opened a bowl of kombucha, that's the fermentation, it builds up a gas. Low stomach acid, uh, so we need the stomach acid to break down our proteins. So if that's not happening properly, then the food can ferment, which can cause the gas. All the acronyms, so IBS, SIBO, EMO, LIBO, it, which is irritable bowel syndrome, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, intestinal methanogen overgrowth, or large intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I am not a fan of the IBS diagnosis, so irritable bowel syndrome. Syndrome refers to a collection of symptoms. It doesn't tell you why you have them. So if you are seeking a diagnosis, you know that you have symptoms. You're going there saying, I've got symptoms. So it's just kind of like validating that, yes, you've got symptoms, but not telling you why. And the studies have shown up to 84% of IBS cases are caused by SIBO. So SIBO actually is a thing, it's a condition, and you can treat it and you can get better. So when I got my SIBO diagnosis, yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, I've got SIBO. But also I was like, okay, this is an actual thing that's wrong. It's not all in my head. This is something I can work with. And I, that's the first time I got this glimmer of hope that it was possible to have a normal functioning digestive system. This glimmer of hope that I can actually have a normal life, that I can actually eat food without freaking out, that I could actually go to any restaurant and eat food, that I could go travel again, that I could start a family. That was my big why. I um, can't wait to be a mum. But when I was that sick, like I think I looked pretty good. Like He was a little bit skinny. But I didn't want to date anyone because I was so full of self-hate and ashamed and embarrassed and... I just isolated myself, so I wasn't dating anyone. Um, that's back. Dating lots of lovely men. Haven't met my man just yet, but meeting so many lovely men. So there's hope. Celiac disease, so that's the one where you are allergic to gluten. And the visceral hypersensitivity that I've talked about as well. So if, those, if the lining of your digestive tract is just overreactive, it's going to react to anything that you put in there, even water. Poor motility, so if your motility is too slow or even too fast, this can cause issues with bloating. And constipation, so if everything's blocked up in there, yeah, that's going to cause bloating too. And just on, the, on constipation, you can have a bowel motion every day but still be constipated. So it's nice to be like a little transit time test. You might want to write this down if you have been like taking notes. Um, ideal transit time is between 19 and 24 hours. Less than 19 hours, you're probably not absorbing all the nutrition from your food. Longer than 24 hours, you're probably reabsorbing some of the toxic waste that your body wants to let go of. So you can either eat like a handful of corn or a handful of grated beetroot and time how long it takes to come out the other end and go from there. So if it's longer than 24 hours, you're constipated, even if you're having a bowel motion every day. So health concerns versus cause and effect. So those first ones I talked about, um, I would say are more uh, cause and effect. So if you eat too fast, that's not going to go well. If you eat too much, you're going to clog the pipes. If you eat too often, that's going to have an issue with your mitochondrial motor complex. That's just the way that our bodies are designed to work. So if you don't use it as it's designed to work, it's not going to work so well. Whereas these bottom ones, these are now conditions that need correcting. So you can have one of them, you could have all of them together, which is a great reason why you want to work with someone that knows what they're doing because you will get better so much faster. Um, a common thing I, because often, yeah, clients find me after trying so many different things and they're like, well, I feel like I've got a degree in SIBO. I'm like, what, what are you going to tell me that's different to the others? Like, my approach is so comprehensive in terms of your digestive health. So, we're looking at stomach acid, motility, gut lining. Um, your microbiome, um, gosh, all the, th all the things with your gut health, but then also what's going on with your body, what's going on with your hormones. If your hormones are out of whack, then that can impair your motility as well. So you can do all the motility work in the world, but if your hormones are out of whack, you're going to be swimming upstream. I'm looking at your nervous system and adrenal system, because you're, if you're constantly living in your sympathetic nervous system, which is aka your fight or flight. So if you are type A personality, go, 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 on the run all day long, you could do all the gut work you like, but because you're in your sympathetic nervous system, your parasympathetic nervous system is going to get shut down, so it's not going to work so well. So when that's not working so well, that means not enough stomach acid, that means less enzymes, that means poor motility. So you have to address the nervous system and adrenal system if that's the thing for you.
So one size fits all fits no one. <laughs> so my program, I can see by freedom, is a group coaching program, but your treatment plan will be individualized to you because even though you and the next person might have pretty similar symptoms, what's causing them is often different. So the method is the same, but the specifics are different. The method being that you probably need to clean out some stuff that we don't want in there, if it's bacterial food or whatever it is. Then we need to heal, so heal the gut lining, repair the damage that's been done. It's not just enough to take away the thing that did the damage, we now need to heal the damage. So if I was to burn my hand on a flame, it's not just enough to take it away from the flame, I now need to heal the damage that's been done. Because if I just leave it and it gets raw and festy and inflamed, it's going to get more sensitive, more sensitive, more sensitive. So yeah, it's not just enough to take out food and tolerances, you need to heal the damage. So yeah. Health concerns versus cause and effect. So, how to decrease bloating. First, here's what you don't want to do. So, common mistakes. I made a lot of these myself, so I see them getting made over and over and over. So, you don't want to restrict all the trigger foods forever. So, we need plant foods for a healthy microbiome, which is a healthy body. So, our microbiome is incredible. When I say microbiome, I'm referring to the large intestinal microbiome because we have other ones. So this one it does so much for us. So it helps us produce serotonin. They say that up to like 96% of our serotonin is produced in the gut. They help us synthesize our B vitamins, which are very important for energy and our nervous system. They help us to control inflammation. They help to keep the gut lining healthy. They communicate with our immune cells. So around 70% of our immune system is in our gut lining. So those are just the cells. But now we need the bacteria to communicate with them to tell them what to do. They are so clever. They are so clever. So if you aren't eating the fiber, which we find in the plant foods, then we are starving our good bacteria. So the answer is not to restrict them forever. The food plans, like say the low FODMAP diet, the biphasic diet, and my Seba Sages food guide, these are designed to be treatment diets, to be followed for like three to four months at a time. If you've done it longer than that, chances are you've starved your microbiome. Doesn't mean that you've nuked your microbiome, doesn't mean that they're extinct, they could just be starving. Antibiotics, like especially the bad ones like Cipro and Flagyl, um, they can cause certain species to become extinct. But if you've starved them, most of the time they're still there. We just need to gently nurture them back to life. So if I was to break my leg, yes, I could walk around on crutches for the rest of my life. But if I want to get use of my leg back, I'm going to need to do some rehab and look after it and heal it. So if you want to actually have food freedom again, freedom to eat out at restaurants, freedom to accept food from your friends, from your loved ones, freedom to travel again without freaking out about what the food's going to be on the other side, you need to heal and you need to reintroduce the foods. And yeah, I'm very good at this. <laughs> so there is a method to doing it and slow and steady is the way. I'll come more to that later. Um, but on that, with the travel thing, that was the big thing for me, kind of making the difference between, okay, I fixed my SIBO versus, okay, now I feel healed. I adore surfing. I love surfing. It's my thing. Um, and I was going on this surf trip with a bunch of friends and it was on a different, I was living in Bali at the time in Indonesia. And we went to a different island and traveled for eight hours in a car and the surf was on the roof. It was really cool. It was very, it was a very cool moment. And as I was in the car driving there, I was like, whoa, I've come so far. I've got no idea what the food situation is going to be when I get there, but I'm not worried at all because I know that my body is strong enough to handle it. Even if the food is not going to be such good quality, like the food that I normally choose to eat for myself, because in remote Indonesia, there's lots of, their thing is fried rice. That's the, st the staple. So I knew that maybe it wouldn't be the healthiest food, but because I was so healthy, because I'd become so resilient, I could handle that food. And it was fine. It was absolutely fine. We had such a great time. Um, please don't go on the carnival. And I did, I did. So I got stuck eating the chicken and eggs. So I would eat these foods because they wouldn't make me bloat. Because there was no fiber. Short term, they wouldn't make me bloat. But then I even started reacting from them and it did make me bloat. So you, if you try the carnivore diet um, or the animal-based keto diet, chances are you have felt better in the short term. But there's a rebound effect. 
So people that go on a carnivore diet or the animal-based keto diet might feel better in the short term, but when they try to eat anything, again, with fiber after, it's even worse than it was before. And also with the carnivore animal-based keto diet, there's lots of saturated fat from the animal products. And then there's a certain group of bacteria called your proteobacteria in your microbiome that love the bile produced when we consume animal fat, the saturated fat. So these guys promote so much inflammation in your digestive tract and they can hurt your gut lining as well. And then on the carnivore diet, because there's no fiber, while feeding bad bacteria, you're also starving your good bacteria. So we can handle a certain percentage of these proteobacteria. As long as they stay under 4% of your total microbiome composition, our body can handle that amount. But if it goes over that and also your good bacteria is on the low side, you can't control the inflammation anymore. So then chances are you also get leaky gut, so it gets through the little gut lining, gets into the bloodstream and goes body wide. And then the main problem that we face here are these little things called lipopolysaccharides, which are in the shell of these proteobacteria or the gram negative bacteria. They are super, 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 super inflammatory. So they can get into the bloodstream if you've got leaky gut. They can also cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain and cause leaky brain. <laughs> and they can cause inflammation in the brain which will feel like that brain fog and feelings of depression. This is how the scientists test for pharmaceutical antidepressants. They inject the mice with lipopolysaccharides, then give them the pharmaceutical antidepressant to test if it was effective. But that's not a serotonin issue. That's not a nervous system issue. That's an inflammation issue. It's often coming from your digestive system. Like I used to feel so depressed. I won't say like I am depressed, because um, you guys are careful to put after I am, but I definitely had really bad feelings of depression and it was really it was really scary like it would be many many times it was like if this is my life i don't want it you know um which is a scary thought to have like i, I did think of ending it which is very confronting um never got to a planning stage but I definitely had those thoughts it's like if this is my life this is awful i don't want this life yeah please don't go on the corner kind of animal diet if you're there it is totally possible to come back. I was there. It was a mistake that I made. So you haven't bombed everything, um, but you will need to do some work to get back. Um, so trying to introduce too much too soon. So if you are pretty sick and you try and eat what I eat now, it probably won't go very well. It's taken me time to get here. So slow and steady reintroductions of food in a specific order is how you get from not being able to eat anything to eating all the things. Got a video from Lindsay on that one. She's very good. Uh, so you don't want to do unnecessary killing treatments in terms of like the antibiotics or the antimicrobials. I hear a lot of people say, well, can't I just nuke everything and then they'll start again, start from scratch? You don't want to do that. So if you do the antibiotics, chances are you can kill some of the species and you don't get them back. The antibiotics recommended for SIBO aren't the worst of the worst. They do tend to stay local to your digestive system. But if you imagine like a garden, so say you've got some weeds in your garden, the quickest way to get rid of the weeds is to set the whole thing on fire. Psh, job done. But now you've scorched the earth, you've killed all the other plants, and you're going to spend a lot longer getting to a state of health, getting to a healthy garden again. So if you just nuke your whole digestive system, you're going to have to start from below zero. Whereas if you spend some time selectively killing what you wanted to kill, so say in your garden example, if you just selectively pulled out the weeds, it might take a little bit longer, but by the time you pulled out the weeds, you don't have to do as much work after that. And to join SIBO Freedom, so my, my group coaching program where we do all the different things, you don't actually have to have SIBO. It's usually like 60%, 40%. But we do need to know if you have SIBO or not. So you do need to do the SIBO test so we can see what's going on. And you can have all the symptoms of SIBO, which is like the bloating, the food intolerances, diarrhea, constipation, anxiety, brain fog, God, so many. You can have all those symptoms and not have SIBO. So it's so, so, so important to test. As a naturopath, I reserve my testing ordering for if it's going to change my treatment protocol. So you don't want to unnecessarily kill. And on the flip side of that, you don't want to do the pre and the probiotics before first testing for SIBO. Because if SIBO is present, or EMO, if the bacteria or the methanogens are in your small intestine and you are swallowing more bacteria, it's just going to add to the problem. So if you've felt more bloated from taking probiotics or prebiotics um, or doing them too soon with the prebiotics, then chances are there could be some SIBO present.
Okay, these are some short-term symptomatic bloating relief tips. Heat packs. So heat packs are super simple. Hot water bottles or those wheat bags or rice packs. Anything with the heat. So when you apply heat to your abdomen, that's going to draw fresh circulation to the area, which brings fresh nutrients, which can help to decrease inflammation. We also have castor oil packs. Love castor oil packs. Um, in the resources that I give with this workshop, and then there's a little instruction on how to do the castor oil pack. Castor oil has this property where it can draw out toxins. Toxins, totally get that it produces like this eye roll, but a toxin is something that is harmful to the body. So if you have stuff floating around your digestive system that is a toxin, it's going to be harmful to your digestive system. Castor oil has this amazing effect of drawing it out and decreasing inflammation. You can also use it on um, your liver, so your liver is underneath your right rib cage. So if you notice you get some a dull ache or some heat underneath there, you can try and cast oil pack. Super efficient. Cold showers, so it can be as short as 30 seconds. So say you've had a hot bath or a sauna or a hot shower, your heat is being dispersed. So the energy, the circulation is going outwards to your extremities. Having a cold shower brings it back. So it brings it back to your internal organs. So that's more circulation, more nutrients to your internal organs, your digestive system. Deep breathing. I love deep breathing. I talk about this a lot. You can also find um, the resource of how to do deep breathing. There's a whole video on it. In short, you want to make your exhales longer than your inhales. And you want to breathe deep down into your belly. This is one of the only scientifically proven ways that you can put yourself back into your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest. So if you've been running around doing your work stuff all day, and maybe you're picking up kids and taking them to the netball and doing all the things, you're going to be in your sympathetic nervous system. So doing 10 deep breaths will be like, whew, ground, parasympathetic nervous system on. So that's your rest and your digest. Helps to calm down the nervous system. So if you've got visceral hypersensitivity, you'll have to calm down those nerves. It's also very good for your vagus nerve. So this is how it turns on the parasympathetic nervous system. It stimulates your vagus nerve, which is so big, connected with your digestive system. It's amazing. It is so, 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 so helpful. And it can seem too simple to be, it seems too good to be true, but I promise you it's not. If you were to do like a seven day challenge, because if I told you just to do this for the rest of your life, you're like, oh my God, Kirsten. But I encourage you to try a seven day challenge. So doing 10 deep breaths, morning and night bonus points if you can remember before meals so first thing in the morning when you start to open your eyes and last thing at night is you're about to close your eyes 10 deep breaths it takes like a minute if you don't have time to do this you are doing life wrong my friend <laughs> so we've all got two minutes in our day and if you use a scale of one to ten to track your progress because we can easily say oh i'm bloated like but yeah but how bloated and then next week oh, i'm still bloated yeah but how bloated if your bloating started at a 9 out of 10 and now it's a 6 out of 10, that's progress. So check in with yourself and see how that one goes. Huge, huge, huge fan. Tummy massage. Um, <laughs> I've got a funny story about the tummy massage. So tummy massage, there's also a separate video on this one. Your large intestine, aka your colon, it starts by your right hip, goes up the side of your body, across the line just above your belly button, and then down to the left, down the left-hand side. But if you imagine a garden hose, say there was like a little stone or pebble at the end of your hose and you tried to turn on the water, it would just clog things up. So you want to start at the end, do like micro circles backwards, and then flush clockwise. So you always want to flush clockwise. The funny story is um, last year I was lucky enough to go on a surf boat trip to the Mentawise, which is like surf mecca. So it was two weeks on a boat. Again, not scared of the travel, not scared of the food, because I knew that my body is so healed that I can eat anything. Um, and then when people find out that I'm a naturopath, they like, have to tell me all their problems. <laughs> it's so funny. And then when they find that I'm a gut health naturopath, they've got no problem telling me about their poo, their farts, or whatever, even if I just met them like two minutes ago. It's, yeah, it's a thing. It's fine. Um, so there was one guy on the boat who hadn't had a bowel motion in four days. So they came to me like, hey, Chris. Um, Daniel hasn't had a poo in four days. It tends to happen every time he goes on a boat. Um, what can we do? So I went to Daniel. The only supplement that I had with me was magnesium because I knew that I'd be surfing a lot. Magnesium helps to get the muscles nice and relaxed again after all that exercise. 
So I gave him some magnesium and I told him to drink some more water because he wasn't drinking enough water and then also to eat some dragon fruit, which is very similar in the fiber to kiwi fruit. That's all we did. And then I gave him some tummy massage. And then while I was doing the tummy massage, his eyes went a bit big and he was like, I can feel things moving. And then the next morning he had a bell motion, felt great. And they continued around the rest of the boat trip. So I was like, poo here. So super simple. Uh, Combinative tea, so this can help with decreasing the spasms in your digestive system. Fennel seeds, caraway seeds, and seeds. Important to get the seeds, because if you just get the fennel plant, that could potentially feed SIBO if you have it. Yeah, making a tea out of all of them. Healthy digestion habits. So I've also got a handout to remind you about these ones, but you can write them down as you go. Get them to stick in your head. These are both short-term and long-term. I've put them in both categories because when you start implementing them, you can expect almost immediate relief. And then these are things that you have to have in place back to like the cause and effect. Like if you're not doing them, like if you're eating every every hour, like that's gonna mess around with your migrating motor complex, you're not gonna feel great. So meal spacing. So your migrating motor complex, we want to be aiming to space our meals four to five hours apart. If you're currently eating every two hours, just start with like two and a half and then three, and then four and a half. If you're someone that suffers with gastritis, that will need to be addressed as well. So gastritis is inflammation of your gastric lining, which is your stomach. So there can be certain things that we can do for that first. Again, this is why it's so worth working with a practitioner, like an expert, a gut expert, because we know what needs to be addressed in what order, and is this a normal reaction, is this not, what do we do next? You'll get better so much faster, it's so cool. And you don't need to second guess yourself, like, oh, do I need to push through this? Or is this like, wrong? So meal spacing, so good. Sitting down to eat. And with these healthy digestion habits, so it takes, they say, seven days to implement a new habit, 21 days for it to stick, 90 days for it to become part of your lifestyle. So the aim with these ones is for it to become so normal to do that it feels weird if you don't. So I'm there now. But I had to teach myself how to do this. It didn't just come naturally. I think sometimes it's quite easy to say, oh, it's easy for Kirsten, she's a naturopath. I trained myself to be a naturopath. So this did not come naturally to me. I had to learn it. And I'm sharing. So sitting down to eat. If we eat standing up, the food will pass, studies have shown this, food will pass through your stomach around 30% faster, which we don't want, even though it may sound better, especially if you're someone that suffers with low, slow motility. If the food passes through your stomach before it's ready, it's gonna go into the small intestine undigested enough. So we need the food to stay in our stomach for the appropriate amount of time so the stomach acid can get to work on your proteins and break it down into individual amino acids. If that doesn't happen, then we get the putrefaction, which can lead to the bloating and inflammation as well. So sitting down to eat. It also helps to make your meal time more of an event and you get to process your meal, you get to be more mindful with your food rather than just like mindlessly eating it. Chewing your food. So I've touched on this already, so we have the teeth there for a reason. So another challenge for the next week, you could see if you can chew each mouthful 20 times. If you are a fast eater, I get that that's gonna seem so slow. But now I am almost always the last one to finish my meal at the table. Again, that wasn't how I was born, that wasn't how I was raised, you know, I had a brother, I'm like, you gotta eat fast. Uh, so chewing your food, your teeth will break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller particles, which makes it easier for the rest of your digestive system to do what it's meant to do. So it makes it easier for the acid, stomach acid to get in there, it makes it easier for the digestive enzymes to get in there. Whereas if you're swallowing big chunks, it takes longer to break it down. I use the example of a gobstopper. You know, if you had gobstoppers when you were young, you get a lick and 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 you get to the middle. It's much easier to break down lots of little gobstoppers than one big gobstopper. It's going to be quicker and more efficient. Also, you have digestive enzymes in your saliva, so keeping it in your mouth for a long period of time makes you remove the digestive enzymes. Eat and only eat. So this is another thing that I train myself to do. I don't play on my smartphone. I don't do emails. I don't... Most of the time, I'm not saying we need to be perfect because that can create stress as well. But most of the time, when I'm eating, I'm only eating. I'm not watching TV. I'm not scrolling on Instagram. I'm focusing on my meals. 
because our digestion is not just our food, like you're digesting information. If you're watching the news, like the news is often stressful. So you're going to be putting yourself into your sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, which is going to shut down stomach acid, shut down motility, shut down those good enzymes. So eat and only eat, preferably in a nice, calm environment. Water. So we need to drink our water. So for most people, um, in an average temperature climate, we are aiming to drink around 2 litres or 70 ounces of water in a day. But there's definitely times to drink your water. So I drink most of my water in the first half of the day. When I wake up, I like to flush through my digestive system. And we don't want to drink with our meals because that will dilute our digestive juices. So it's just like if I want to get nail varnish off, if I use straight acetone, it's going to take it off. If I dilute it with water, probably still get it off. It just takes more rubbing. It'll take more time. So ideally, we stop drinking water around 15 meals, 15 minutes before our meals. And then depending on the size of the meal and what you ate, you can start drinking in 45 minutes, an hour after eating as well. So that can make a difference. And like, do the best that you can with all these things. Because if you try and like, oh, there are so many things to remember. Do the best that you can and build on from there. There's a really good book uh, called Atomic Habits. And he talks about the little 1% improvements. So aim to be 1% more mindful than you were yesterday. Oh no, that's unfortunate. Um, and these will add up over time. Life, that might happen again. <laughs> I'm going to pause. That was one of my neighbours. <laughs> Life. Okay, so the deep breathing, it makes such a difference. And these habits make such a difference. I once had a client, um, she was doing sea freedom and bloating wasn't going down as much as usual, as much as I would have expected. And I totally believe that she was following my advice with the food and taking the supplements that I recommended. I was like, this is weird. Like normally bloating goes down pretty quick and stays down. So I was doing like another run through with her and talking to her and she's like, oh, you know, yeah, but yesterday I pretty much inhaled my food as I was running out the door. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What have I been saying about chewing your food? What have I been saying about sitting down to eat? All these things. Oh, yes, 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 but I didn't have time. Um, like these things are foundational to healthy digestion. If you're not doing them, but spending all your money on supplements, spending money on more testing, chasing more diagnoses, you're going to be chasing things for a long time and wasting your money. So I, got, I went through them again with her. I was like, oh, just hear me out. Just humor me. Don't change anything with your food. Don't change anything with your exercise. Don't change anything with your supplements. Keep doing those things the same so we have a comparative marker. I got her to chew her food. I got to do sitting down to eat. She was doing the meal spacing. Um, and she wasn't super onto the breathing. The breathing was like hit and miss. So I got her to do those three things consistently for a week. The bloating had gone down from a 7 or 8 out of 10 to a 2 out of 10 within a week. So please, please, please don't underestimate these because they seem too simple or too good to be true. They are foundational, 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 foundational. And free and simple and you have control over this. So I remember when I was here, my, all my food intolerances, I felt like I didn't have control over how my body reacted to the foods. You can control your meal spacing. You can control sitting down to eat. You can control chewing your food. So it'll help to give you some almost like power back, you know, empowering. And then, so movement. So we do need some movement and how much movement will depend on where you're at. A nice way to know how much you may need at this time is to pay attention to how you feel after exercising. So if you feel energized, that was a good amount for where you're currently at. If you feel depleted, it was maybe a little bit too much for where you're currently at. So while healing our digestive system, we want to do the more gentle kinds of exercise. If something is too intense or we do it for too long, we can cause the levels of cortisol to rise in our body, which is one of our stress hormones. One of the things that cortisol does in our body is causes those tight junctions in our gut to separate, leaky gut. So we want to do lower intensity and lower duration most of the time while healing our gut. So gentle yoga, like hatha yoga or, or yin yoga going for a walk instead of a run. You can still do weight training if that's your jam, just do probably a slightly lower weight and for not as long. So if you've got a favorite exercise that you do, you can potentially still do it, just kind of tone it down. 
So if you're now doing hot yoga, maybe do a slower hatha yoga. So you can still get your fix, but just adjusting it for where you're at. And this one, I get that it can seem a bit woo-woo, but it's okay. If you tell yourself you can't eat that, your body's going to perceive it as a threat. If your body perceives a threat, it's going to go into its fight or flight sympathetic nervous system stress response. Survival instinct trumps everything. What's the point in being able to digest that apple that you had at breakfast if you're dead? What's the point in making babies if you're dead? So survival instinct is always going to come out on top. So if your body, if you mentally perceive something as a threat, your body is going to respond that way. So it might seem a bit mm, in the beginning, the more you do it, the more natural it will become as well. So when you're sitting down to eat your meal, even if it feels fake in the beginning, just go with it. Um, this food is nourishing and healing to my body. This food is going to help me with energy. This food is going to feed my microbiome. And we can go from there. Right. Then, short-term removal of inflammatory in foods. Short-term. So the Biphasy diet, the SIBO status food guide that I have, these are all designed to be short-term, like three to four months max. And the reason for it is um, because you want to decrease inflammation as much as possible so that your body can heal. I'm in the camp of get in, get out. So do what you got to do and then get back to your life. So I, choose, I do give the advice of being specific with your foods for a specific amount of time and then you can bring them back in after. There was a question um, when I did this live. My, her teenage son refuses or won't give up dairy and gluten. Can he still do my program? Absolutely, he can still do zero freedom, but he might not get the benefits that he's chasing. So if you are still continuing to eat inflammatory foods, and gluten and dairy are probably the most inflammatory up there with processed sugar, if you are continuing to promote inflammation while we're trying to decrease inflammation, it's like you're swimming upstream. So yeah, we might get some headway, but you'll be needing to do treatment for longer. So if you can be specific and choose to eat more anti-inflammatory foods for a period of time, you'll get better faster, you'll heal faster, you can get back to the life that you want to live faster. <laughs> All right. Oh, this is Anita. Is this going to work? Bummer. No, I don't think that's going to work as a video. Um, this is Anita. So she did Zero Freedom Stories Edition, which is one that we recorded. So they got to do the program for a reduced amount in exchange for sharing their stories. So the reason I wanted to do this, it comes back to like you guys, it's absolutely understandable, I used to do it too. Maybe put me up on a bit of a pedestal because oh, Kirsten's a naturopath, this comes natural to her, she's got all the knowledge. So Super Freedom Stories edition, I did to show you, everyone can get the results. So Anita was saying here that her, so she started on a Saturday, and her bloating, she used to measure, this is on my Instagram page if you want to go and find it, it'll also be on my YouTube. Um, her bloating, she used to measure in scales of how pregnant or not she looked. So beginning of the day, she looked nine months pregnant. After just one day of, of following the recommendations that I made for her, she got her bloating down to a five out of ten. One day. It stayed down. Um, so long-term bloating resolutions. So that's fast, like in one day. So when you get onto the right track of what you want to do, you can get results super fast. No matter how long you've been sick. I can't remember right now off the top of my head how long she'd been sick. But most of my clients, it's five plus years that they've been struggling. All right, long-term bloating resolution. So you need to find out what you're dealing with. Um, you might not necessarily find that one root cause that everybody talks about. I can't tell you my one root cause. I can tell you that I was given lots of antibiotics as a child. I constantly had tonsillitis. Um, I restricted diet to it a lot, so I messed up my, I starved my microbiome. Um, I had a lot of emotional stuff to deal with, and then I also had SIBO. So SIBO was a thing, but what had I been doing that, would let, that resulted in the SIBO in the first place? So by the time we get a condition like SIBO, things have been going wrong below the surface for a while. Our bodies are amazing at adapting and getting us through, but over time, it stops being able to adapt. Just like you can, I don't know, the classic sort of thing, like people that work 80 hours a week, and as soon as they go on holiday, they get sick. So their body is like getting through, getting through, getting through, 
gets the sense to kind of relax, it's like, okay. It's like a SIBO, like your body can adapting, 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 adapting until it breaks. But it's not actually broken. It just needs some love. I don't believe that anyone's broken beyond repair. So you can come back from uh, So testing, I'm a huge advocate for doing a SIBO test. This is probably the one test that I get pretty much all my clients to do. But I am a gut health naturopath. So if you're coming to me, chances are you've got gut issues. And then we can get so much information from the SIBO test when it's interpreted correctly. You can order this through us if you go to my website, kirstengreen.com. You'll see the SIBO testing. We also offer the interpretation service because it's not just enough to do the test. You need to know what the information means. I've seen so many misdiagnoses that people come to me after multiple rounds of doing antimicrobials for SIBO. When I look at their first test result, it's like, that wasn't SIBO. That was more LIBO. So now they have SIBO because they've done the unnecessary killing that I talked about before. Microbiome testing is interesting. Um, when you come to see us, because we're so well-versed in the, the digestive system, I can tell if your microbiome's off. So if you're getting the brain fog, if you've got histamine intolerance, if you're getting the bloating towards the end of the day, it gets worse over time, then your yeah, microbiome's out of balance. So SIBO tests, super, super important. Again, you don't need to have SIBO to join SIBO Freedom. I just love that name. You've got a better name, does it? No. But we do need to know if you have SIBO or not because that will decide the treatment that's appropriate for you. So as the naturopath that I am, um, my team are, we test when it will determine treatment stuff. A lot of the stuff we can figure out through correct case taking. So if you're telling me that you're tired, if you're telling me that you're waking up at 3 a.m., if you're telling me you get dizzy when you stand, if you're telling me that you have some anxiety, your adrenals need some love. I don't need a test to tell me that. I can hear it. I can see it. Consulting with a practitioner. Um, it's an investment. Totally get it. But it will provide so much return on investment. You will save so much time. You will save so much effort. And you will save yourself money in the long run. Um, I get that... You've probably spent thousands already. You've probably seen multiple patients already. Um, but we are very, very, very good at what we do. We get the results because my programs are so comprehensive and holistic and looking at all of the parts. So fixing all the parts that need fixing so that your body and your digestive system is working well again. If I was to break my, I use a Mac, if I was to break my MacBook, I would take it to the Apple store. I wouldn't just take it to a general computer store because if I've lost all my data, I know that they're going to have the best chance of getting it back fastest. So yeah, consulting the practitioner. And I do believe you could figure this all out by yourself, absolutely. Um, all the information is out there, but putting it together for you and, yeah, I, I, I believe you could figure it out by yourself. It would probably just take a lot, a lot longer and you probably waste time that you could be living your life and you probably waste money as well. So it's worth it. It's worth it. The healthy digestion habits that I've talked about and fix all the parts that deem healing. So talking in terms of SIBO, like if you Google it, Google will tell you that SIBO is a high relapse rate condition. That's if you focus on just the SIBO. So this is my problem with the elemental diet. This is my problem with antibiotics. If you're just doing that and nothing else, like how can you expect full resolution of healing? So the elemental diet I only use as like a third or fourth line treatment. The elemental diet is effective at getting rid of SIBO bacteria, but it doesn't do anything else. It's not going to heal your gut lining. It's not going to repair your microbiome. It's not going to teach you how to reintroduce foods. And I, I did a poll on my Instagram stories a couple of weeks ago to see for those of my people that had done the elemental diet who had good results. 83% had bad results. Those aren't good odds. So 17% 70, um, had good results from doing the elemental diet. Those aren't good odds. Those aren't good odds. Whereas doing Zero Freedom or like the private coaching, oh my gosh, I can't even tell you what the odds are. So almost everybody, almost everybody feels a lot better at the end of the program. For some people, they might need to do a little bit more work after. It depends what we uncover. So like in Zero Freedom, we do in the digestive system. But if we suspect you've got mold or biotoxins, we also need to address that. If you've also got hormone stuff, we need to address that. So it depends on what's going on, what else is going on for you. Um, but yeah, with the digestive system, everybody goes through the same method of healing up the digestive system, so correcting stomach acid, enough digestive enzymes, motility, gut lining. 
sense of it um, and also teaching you how to introduce all the foods so you get to a place where you can eat all the foods again without the flares. All right, I think this is going to be Gemma. So I would love, oh, I wish I could show the video on this one. It is on a different recording, um, but she is on Instagram as well. So Gemma was talking, she did the Seal Freedom Stories edition as well. She was saying how she had almost, oh, look, quite similar today, <laughs> almost immediate symptomatic bloating relief. And she was blown away by how the symptoms went down so fast. So by the end of day one and then by two day, by three, it stayed down and just got better and better and better. So she was back in her jeans and she made a little joke about how she was able to stay in her jeans all day long. Whereas by nighttime, usually changing back into her yoga pants, <laughs> which is so common. I had to do that too. Um, and then in a different video, like it, I think it was by week two, she commented that she felt like she'd shed a whole layer. She dropped about 10 pounds, which was not fat, which would be like the water weight. So the body will hold on to water as a result of inflammation. So if you have that all over body puffiness, it could be fat, but if you're suffering all this gut stuff, it's likely inflammation, water weight. So because we managed to decrease the inflammation so fast, her body just dropped this excess water weight, which is pretty cool. Um, slow and steady reintroduction of food. So if you want to be able to eat all the foods, you're going to have to bring them in slowly and steadily. I talk about one teaspoon at a time. So one teaspoon is enough of a serving size to start feeding the bacteria again in your large intestine microbiome. So in all the different plant foods, we have different kinds of fibers. So different kinds of fibers will feed different kinds of bacteria. When you feed a diverse range of bacteria in your large intestine microbiome, then you now have the tools or the bacteria to break down all the different kinds of fiber. So it's like this upward spiral effect. The more diverse your microbiome, the more diverse foods you can tolerate and you build from there. So if you try and give them too much too soon, because remember they're probably starving, they can't do the work that you want them to do. So if you were to dump a whole bunch of water on a very new seedling, you're probably going to flood it and you might kill it. And then gently sprinkle it and let it get stronger and stronger and stronger. So one teaspoon at a time. Um, these videos, I'm sure I can add to the end of this presentation. So have a look to the end of this presentation to watch these videos. Uh, so this is Lindsay. So Lindsay actually didn't have SIBO, joined SIBO Freedom Stories Edition. And she had been stuck eating the same five foods for the past three years. How restricting is that? She'd also put off starting a family because of her digestive issues. Um, just so that you know, I would never share clients' details, but this was a stories edition, so we had this. the whole point was sharing their stories. So Lindsay has shared that yeah, she put off starting a family because she was so unwell. And she was a nurse, so she felt like she had so much knowledge, but coming and joining Super Freedom, she finally got the results that she wanted. So stuck eating five foods for the last three years. By the end of week one, she was up to 22 plant foods. By the end of the program, she was up to 43, I think. And then she emailed me one month after finishing the program, she was up to 60 without the flares. So that's what she was saying in this video here. So slow and steady, one teaspoon at a time. That was a game changer for Lindsay. All right, so how we can help, we being team green. So gut health experts, we are amazing. So SIBO Freedom is my little baby, currently the only way to work with myself directly. And I do this a couple times per year. So depending on when you're watching this video, come have a look at my website, see when the next one is and go from there. We also do, my team does private consulting. So you can start at any time of the year, um, depending on which option you want. So with Seba Freedom, there is a private consultation included. So you get to chat to us, have our eyes like laser focused on you. And then it's just so wonderful. It's so supportive. So it's a 12 week online group coaching program and it's designed to help you heal your digestive issues. So yes, SIBO, but also LIBO, candida, parasites, all the gut stuff, we deal with that. And then by the end of this program, you can expect to have more energy. You can expect to know what foods are good for you right now, which ones aren't. You can expect to have a much more diverse range of foods that you can tolerate without the bloating flares. So yeah, less brain fog, better sleep, 
more balanced moods, more energy to play with your kids, that freedom to go travel again. Um, yeah, it gives you back your freedom to do what you want to do and not be living your life dictated by your digestive issues. Uh, Tasty from food for you to food freedom. Freedom, that's so nice. And I've designed it to be the way it's set. So we have a live session each week. And then you also have the Facebook group for support throughout the week. So we're in there answering questions every day, Monday to Friday. So you don't just get given this bit of paper from a practitioner saying, okay, off you go and do this thing, come back in two months. We are there monitoring you all the way through. We are adjusting your treatment plan all the way through if necessary. We're there to answer your questions. We're there to like educate and teach and inspire. And there's recipe sharing, there's meal plans, there's food lists, there's and, 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 and. It's so lovely and it gets the results. So these were what some past sea of freedom, like if we asked them, like if you were to go back in time and tell your past self to do your past sea of freedom, what would you say? And like the common theme is just do it. Don't hesitate, go and do it. It's worth it, it's worth the time, it's worth the money, do it. Yeah, so if you've got any questions on sea of freedom, just let us know. Uh, you can find our contact form at the website as well, kirstenbean.com, yeah. This one, this is a common one. May seem expensive, but you're far better off seeing a specialist early on. It's not as easy as you think to solve, and trying by unmethodical methods won't be effective. So it's an investment. How much money are you wasting by trying to do it yourself or by following things on the internet that weren't designed for you? Because there is no one size fits all approach. We tailor it to you. So yeah, you can join Zebra Freedom through that link. I am super proud of it. I love Zebra Freedom. Well, all right, um, so when I did the live, I went through some questions and I saved them so I could do this for record this recording as well. So I'm going to go through some of the questions that came up when I did it live. All right, Catherine asked, what are the root causes of SIBO? So common ones are low stomach acids, common ones are poor motility, slow motility, food poisoning, multiple rounds of antibiotics. Stress would be the biggest ones that cause from there. So stress like is so underrated. If you have chronic stress, it's going to put you into a sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight. That's going to shut down your digestion. If you think of someone like giving you a fright, like boom, yeah, you take a sharp intake of breath. So that's like paradoxical breathing. So now your belly button has gone back towards your spine on the inhale. It should go out on the inhale. And if that happens, all your, all your abdominal organs are contracted. So how's your food meant to move through properly if it can't get through these contractions? Um, Abby, can you really heal SIBO or are you just managing it? If you can't pinpoint the cause, how can you cure it? So me, it's like I can't tell you my one cause. I shared that I had multiple rounds of antibiotics, I had quite a stressful childhood, I restricted dieted, I went um, too low carb for too long. So those were multiple factors that led to me getting SIBO. So I am SIBO free for six years, I haven't relapsed once because I put the effort into repairing all the parts of my digestive system. And I also now have very good, healthy digestion habits, not to underestimate those. So I healed my microbiome, I introduced the foods slowly and steadily, I did some emotional work, so in Zero Freedom, we do cover the emotional aspects because we tend to have certain patterns and behaviors that can be self-sabotaging. Like if you know better, but still do the thing, why are you doing the thing? If you're overeating at nighttime, even though you know it makes you feel bad, why do you keep doing that? There could be a physical cause, you could be deficient in nutrients, but there could also be an emotional cause. So we get to that as well, so I teach you how to do that. Catherine, have you worked with CIFO? Oh, I didn't put that one in there, did I? Fungal overgrowth. So CIFO is small intestinal fungal overgrowth. A lot of people have issues with that as well, so that candida stuff. Candida is a bad, bad, bad guy. It, it absolutely is a part of our natural ecosystem, like our microbiome and stuff. But if it becomes overgrown, that's when it's a problem. So candida overgrowth is a problem. So if you have the brain fog after eating fruit, if you have a white coating on your tongue, these are signs of candida overgrowth. We can handle some, we just need it to be in the correct amounts. Uh, Natalia, is dysbiosis the same as LIBO? Pretty much. So it's an imbalanced large intestine microbiome. Microbiome analysis are, are cool, they're super interesting. This is where I get like super nerdy, I love it. <laughs> so when I get a microbiome analysis back, I'm looking at all the different percentages of all these different bacteria. 
I like the different countries will have different tests, but in the States there's Ombre, there's Cosmos ID, in Europe there's Nirvana, um, there's a few different ones, but I like the ones that will tell me the percentages, where something like a GI map or Genova will tell you your lactobacilli plus plus or four plus plus, whereas a microbiome analysis will say that you might show that you've got 1.025% uh, of your lactobacilli. And this can be very helpful because you can also look at your proteobacteria percentage. So if we have 4% and under of proteobacteria, we tend to be able to manage the amount of inflammation that they cause. But then we also need to look at your butyrate producers. Butyrate is a short chain fatty acid that helps to decrease inflammation. So we want those to be around um, 40%. That all the all the butyrate producers. So if your butyrate producers are around fifteen percent, you not you don't have enough good bacteria to control the inflammation that's being produced. So it's very nerdy. <laughs> um, Vicky, what is best to treat the vis the, the visceral hypersensitivity? It depends what's caused yours. So we can all have very similar symptoms, but what's causing yours could be different. So it could be that your nerve endings are oversensitive and so that could be working on like your whole nervous system it could be something like magnesium it could be if it's like being overreactive by inflammation then maybe some turmeric can help to decrease the inflammation so it depends on what's causing yours will be the answer um <laughs> caroline i have constant bloating looking two to three months pregnant before breakfast and moving towards five to six months by the end of the day i'm tracking food and see no correlation to fodmaps or any other foods I have candidiasis and in three months into a strict protocol and diet. Most symptoms have resolved or nearly resolved, including normal bowel movements, but the bloating is the same. Getting rid of fruits was helpful to reduce extreme feeling, but can't get past the six month bowel at the end of the day. Wondering what else could be at play. Took a SIBA test and was negative on all gases with lactulose and very borderline with glucose or hydrogen sulfide only. High score was only a four. So mystified and frustrated. So just with that little bit of information, because the bloating is getting worse as the day goes on, I think of large intestine microbiome suffering, not, often not being strong enough to digest the food that gets shunted there. So the bacteria in our large intestine is responsible for the final stages of digestion. So if you don't have enough of your good bacteria, then the food can just sit there and ferment and cause the bloating. So that's a very common telltale. So flat, flat or minimal bloating in the morning, worse by the end of the day, and it's gradually worse. Um, also, it could be slow motility. It could also be the visceral hypersensitivity. And with the candida diet and the low FODMAP diet, so the, the food part is used to help manage the symptoms. It doesn't correct problems. So if you need to kill something, you're going to need to take antimicrobials for that. Uh, candida, we can crowd out. So if it's a candida overgrowth, I would prefer, depending, depending on the severity, so if it's not that bad, then by rebalancing the microbiome, we can crowd out the excess and make it more hospitable for your good bacteria to grow and less hospitable for your candida to overgrow. Um, did I address everything in there? And it could be that visceral hypersensitivity as well. So this is where it comes back to healing all the parts, not just focusing on candida, not just focusing on SIBO. You need to look at the whole picture. All right. Uh, Tanya, about motility, how does that work when you're having regular large daily one to three times bowel motions without straining, but the gas still stays trapped and doesn't move? So you could do that transit time test to see actually what is going on with your motility. So eating a handful of corn or grated beetroot, see how long it takes to come out the other end. And the tummy massage could be helpful, so helping to move it through manually. Um, could also look into a visceral manipulation therapist. Um, this could include a physio or an osteopath or a chiro. Sometimes we need like a little adjustment for some people. Uh, if you get any pain on the midway point from your belly button to your right hip, so draw a diagonal line down, the midway point is something called your ileocecal valve. This is where the small intestine goes into the large intestine. This can sometimes get stuck shut or stuck open. So stuck open, it allows the bacteria to retrograde flow back into your intestines, which can be SIBO stuck shut, build up of stuff in your small intestine. So you can do like a little bit of massage around that area, so like rolling it. But it's quite tricky to get our hands in the angle, so seeing someone that can get their hands on there can be quite helpful. My recommendation is to email a few in your area and ask if they know about the ileocecal valve, because if they know about that, 
and they might know that their, their desk is looking like a hole. Um, Miranda, how do you find out if it is a food intolerance or a SIBO? It could be both. So to find out if it's SIBO, you do the SIBO breath test. You can't go by symptoms. Don't go by symptoms. So my SIBO, I, so I was constipated most of my life. So normally that goes hand in hand with methane SIBO or emo. Uh, my methane was fine. I had issues with hydrogen. So methane SIBO is not the only cause of constipation. So I had to work on my TLV. I had to work on my microbiome. So super, 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 super important to test. Can mold be a root cause? I've treated mold illness for two years with no SIBO relief. So mold can be like what we call a self-infection. So you might get, so you said you haven't got any relief or something like that. But say you do get some relief and then you keep like rebounding back like a rubber band, this could be a self-infection. So if there's mold, you have to get the mold out. There's, there's no situation where having mold in your system is okay. <laughs> so you're going through that, it's not nice. Is there a way to address histamine intolerance while treating SIBO? Yes, by healing up your digestive system, by rebalancing the microbiome, getting the immune system happy again, histamine intolerance resolves. So I had histamine intolerance. Um, where if I ate high histamine foods, I would get a racing heart rate. Um, my skin would get itchy, I'd get very hot. Um, I see it with bad headaches and anxiety. So those are my histamine intolerance symptoms. Absolutely no problem with histamine foods now. How do you do meal spacing if you also have gastritis? Going beyond three hours without meals makes me burp excessively. This is where working with us, you'll get the results because there could be so many different things at play there. Is your gut, is your stomach lining hurt? Is your pyloric sphincter malfunctioning, which is the sphincter from your stomach into your small intestine? Is it too much stomach acid? Is it too little stomach acid? So we need more information to kind of know from there. What about drinking broth between meals? Will that halt the migrating motor complex? Anything with calories will halt the migrating motor complex. Where I'm at now, like I'm okay with having tea in between some meals because I'm like in maintenance, like my body works super, super, super well. If you are in healing stage, you wanna be on top of it. All these little things are gonna add up to the big things. So rather than chasing one big answer, when you can do all these little things, meal spacing, sitting down to eat, chewing your food, taking the right supplements, getting some things. These little changes will add up to the big results. If you've damaged your microbiome from doing long-term low FODMAP keto paleo carnivore type diets, is that reversible? Almost always yes. Almost always yes. So your microbiome might be starving, but most of the time the species haven't become extinct. So it's usually the antibiotics that will cause different species of bacteria to become extinct. But yeah, most of the time, it, it will take time, and slowly and steadily coming back from there. I was there, so yeah. Bum, ba, da, bum. Ah, Tracy, my son's GI didn't test, but put him on rifaximin because assumed based on bloating, burping, farting, dizziness, bloating. I know this is only the first step, and he won't be able to help. Shame, I'm so sorry that happened. Um, please test before doing things like rifaximin, because you can have very similar symptoms to SIBO, Apologies for that noise. <laughs> you can have very similar symptoms to SIBO, but it not actually be SIBO. It could be LIBO, large intestine stuff. All those symptoms could be caused by a large intestine undergrowth. So if you go and take antibiotics, you're gonna cause a further undergrowth. That's another mistake I see people making is they get stuck in the killing phase and get too scared to progress into the pre and the probiotics. So they stay in the killing stage or in the restricting stage and just make things worse, unfortunately. So we have to take those next steps. Yeah. Um, where have we got? Um, how strong is the link between digestive issues, whether it be SIBO or not, and other things like acne and extreme period pain? Will fixing the di digestive issues help with those kind of issues too? Yes. Um, you, they can't, oh my God. <laughs> I could link everything to the gut. So I lost my period for two years. I had really, 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 really bad acne. Um, I've never had bad acne again. Um, I love this book. So your skin is your reflection of what's going on in the inside. So acne is a very inflammatory condition. So inflammation on the inside is going to come up with inflammation on your skin. Rosacea is also very connected to gut issues in SIBO. Hives connected to your gut as well. Acne, so ideally, um, our channels of elimination are our urine and our feces. So 
what's not going what's not getting eliminated properly through those channels can come out through our skin so it can be inflammation from our gut and also toxicity in our gut as well and then hormones so if your body is in survival mode so like digestive issues are so stressful if your body's in survival mode things that are not imperative to survival in that moment get shut down including your reproductive organs if your body perceives that it is in a state of being under threat it's not an ideal time to make babies so libido is one of the first things to go down when we're under stress i think pretty much all my clients have a low libido when coming to see me it's a marker of health when they start to get that back Um, how do you check if gut lining is okay? Um, the way that I do it is how my client is feeling. So is the brain fog decreasing? Is the puffy decreasing? When your gut lining is nice and strong, because if you think about what your, your gut is, it's like a series of pipes. So you're putting the outside world on the inside of your body. So we want to protect our bloodstream as much as possible. We only want to absorb the things that are helpful to us, keep out everything that is harmful. So when your gut is nice and strong, you don't really notice. You forget what it's like. Um, how do you put it? Like when I eat my meals now, I eat my meal because I'm hungry, I enjoy the meal, and I forget about food until the next time that I'm hungry. Whereas before, I'd be constantly checking the bloat. I'd be like patting my stomach. I'd be lifting up my top. I'd be like, oh, look, what's that? Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a bit of brain fog. I'm tired now. That eventually fell away by itself. And then one day I look around, like, oh, it's been a long time since any of that happened. So that's, it's so lovely when that happens, when you can forget how sick you used to be. So I look for the little signs. So signs, you can go the other way, signs of leaky gut, brain fog, feelings of depression, all over body inflammation, pain, um, overreactive immune system, histamine intolerance, autoimmune conditions. So when all those things start to heal, that's a really good sign that your gut lining is healed as well. Okay, if I live on antihistamines due to chronic highs, can it be caused by SIBO and can it be healed by your program? That flows on quite nicely. So, yeah, so there's a time and a place for pharmaceuticals. So, so I'm not the naturopath's like, yeah, pharmaceuticals. <laughs> so if you can only survive by taking antihistamines, we don't want to take those away just yet. So we want to come and heal the reasons why you have to have all these antihistamines. And then as you get better, you can decrease your dependence on antihistamines until you no longer need them. Uh -huh. So yes, we can help. Okay. Last question, Steve. What if I have already started a leaky gut program? And actually, sorry, I think I missed one because someone else was asking me about if they have another practitioner. Do we work with other practitioners? For sure. So if you are doing something already, we can work with that practitioner. We can look at the treatment plan that you have going on. May We may make adjustments. So depending on what the leaky gut program is. So if... Steve was doing lots of pre and probiotics, but he actually has SIBO, then we might adjust it and do it later. So you need to, if, you, if there's SIBO, so you need to deal with the SIBO first before coming to most of the pre and probiotics. Some are appropriate, most aren't. So it depends on what the program is, but we can definitely look at it. And if you have supplements already, we look at those and we use those first. We don't need to buy all new things like um, definitely I am the minimum effective dose person. I won't scrimp. Um, I'll say, you got to do this, do this, and you'll get better. Um, but we work with you as much as possible and help you in the easiest, best way possible. Cool. All right. If you're still here, thanks so much. We're going to add those videos at the end. And if you have any questions, just um, write to us and let us know. Lots of love, superstar. It gets better, I promise. I didn't think it was possible for me. I thought I was too far gone, but I am so vibrant <laughs> physically, mentally, and emotionally. And I want that for you too. All right. Lots of love, Superstar. I started on Saturday, and so typically uh, by the end of the day, I am about a nine when it comes to bloating. And for me, my scale aligns with how many months pregnant I look. So I go from a zero to a 10. And so usually by the end of the day, I look nine months pregnant. And on Saturday, by the end of the day, I was a five.
So I am one week into SIBO Freedom and I am already feeling so much better. I had almost immediate symptom relief once I started to make a couple of the changes in terms of dietary and some habit changes that Kirsten recommended and I actually couldn't believe it. Like on day two and then three and then four and then five and then six, uh, not having bloating after my meals, being able to keep my jeans like buttoned up until four in the afternoon at roll well, until I went to bed, which never happens. You usually have to change into yoga pants uh, in the afternoon, not having to lie down after dinner because I'm having such intense stomach pain. Like to have such immediate relief of those things has been, has just allowed me to breathe. I wanted to give an update on how I'm doing in the SIBO Freedoms Story Edition. I just completed week one, only one week in, and I had a huge, like an aha moment, but I'm, I can already tell this program is going to be great for me. I'm excited for the next 11 weeks. So that aha moment was just the fact that I don't need to eat like a whole vegetable, like a whole serving, you know, a typical serving. Kirsten has taught us that even just a teaspoon is a serving amount for our microbiomes at the moment because our microbiomes are so compromised. So that freed up the pressure for me to feel like I needed to eat like an entire, you know, zucchini or an entire tomato. It's like, just cut a piece off, a little piece, throw it in with my meal. I can do that with two or three other things. And so I am so excited and proud to say that at the end of week one, the girl who was only eating five foods prior for the last almost three years, I ate 22 plant foods after week one and I didn't flare, I did fine.